I was still hurting last week. As I broke three ribs and I severely bruised my left leg in a fall out here in this patio area on a Friday night. It's crazy. And, uh, but I'm pain free right now. Pain free, yeah. Thank you for all your prayers. And uh, I, I got off the hard stuff, pain stuff, you know, Norco, quite a while ago. So I'm just using a leave. And it's sufficient. So uh, anyway, so I thank you for all your prayers and hanging in there with us. And for Jeremy on Sunday mornings and Ray on Wednesdays and Bill Johnson, another of ours that comes midweek. Uh, and then Stephen on Fridays. So we, we've been covered for all of our Bible studies in, in my absence. And I'm so proud of these guys and so thankful for them. And so we, we carry on. It's, it's the Lord's work. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do a little review in 1 Corinthians. And I'll try to keep it short because we have communion this morning as well. And, uh, but I do want to do a little review because uh, I left off. I was about to teach chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, but since it's been five weeks, I think we need a refresher. So that's what I'm going to do now. Father, again, uh, pray over the reading and study of your word. And Father, we pray for Debbie Brand, who's in a hospital in Riverside with blood clots and uh, really could be serious, but she's in a good hospital and they have a a good pulmonary doctor down there, we understand. And so we're trusting that, Father, you're going to heal her either supernaturally or through the medical profession. Either way, Lord, we accept it and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, we pray for Debbie's healing. Amen. The title of my message is Christians Should Not Sue Another Christian. And that's the early part of chapter 6. But I'm going to go back to chapter 1 and right away Paul has to scold this church and, uh, but he starts out this way with them. He says, uh, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother to the church of God which is at Corinth to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So even though he's about to scold them because of some stuff that they're not doing right in the church, they're squabbling, and uh, of course we never do that, but they did anyway. <laughs> and so, and there's times he uses sarcasm, but he never questions their salvation. I, I like that. So he always commends them where commendation is due. So he says, uh, I thank my God, verse 4, this is chapter 1, always concerning you for the grace of God that was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So, verse 7, that you come short no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he opens up this way. And then we move on later in the chapter and he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, verse 10, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Uh, The scriptures consistently call for us to be in unity. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, which is Peter, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptize in my own name. So he diverts away from himself, Apollos and Cephas, which is Peter. And so they're squabbling uh, who, who they want to be their teacher or their leader. Well, I like Paul. Well, I like Peter better. Apollos is really a good speaker. And so that's what was going on in the church. And he says, ought not to be.
And so then, uh, picking up verse 18, he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Amen. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign or a miracle, and Greeks seek after wisdom. You know, the Greeks, they had the great scholars, Socrates, Plato, those guys. They were really into the intellectual end of things. But in that, they were missing the, the truth of the scriptures. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then over in chapter 2, it talks about the, the, the unbelieving and the unbeliever's mind. And in, in verse uh, 14 of chapter 2, it says this, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And that's what Paul's bearing down on, that it's not so much this great learning that they can acquire, and, and you know, there's nothing wrong with going to college and getting a, a college degree and all that, but just the simple preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ and what the Bible factually teaches you don't have to be a gigantic scholar to understand the scriptures because the Holy Spirit opens them up to you. Amen. And so, and then verse 3 starts out, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So they were baby Christians. They were Christians. We saw that in the first chapter. He doesn't doubt their salvation. But they weren't very long, very far along in their walk with Jesus. And so, consequently, they're squabbling among themselves. Who's to be their leader? Who are they going to listen to? And then, uh, in, in verse 6 of chapter 3, it says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. And so, Paul takes it off himself or off of those other guys and he places it where it belongs, on Jesus, on the Lord, that he's the one that brings the increase. They are simply his servants, his messengers, but God, by his spirit, he's the one that regenerates hearts Amen. and calls people to repentance. So Paul, Paul's getting things stabilized here, getting things in proper order. In chapter 4, uh, he picks up that theme again, verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. They were, you know, comparing Apollos and Peter with Paul, and he says, ought not to be, that we're not the ones, all we are is, is a messenger. And, uh, and then he uses sarcasm, verse 8. He says, you're already full, you're already rich, you have reigned as kings without us, and indeed I could wish that you did, did, that you did reign, that we might also reign with you. In other words, you're so smart, you're so sharp that I, I wish that we could reign alongside of you because you, you got everything under control. And so that's sarcasm, and Paul's pretty good at that. Uh, and then moving on in chapter 5 is where they, they really run into a problem of incest in, in the church. And the problem with incest in this church at that time was they were not only tolerating it, but they were kind of approving of it, that a man had his, his uh, father's wife. 
And so he's scolding them about that, what you need to do to correct that issue. And um, he, he calls for actually excommunication, uh, but with, with the purpose of restoration. So it's not just to kick somebody out of the church, but it's for restoration. And I shared briefly, and I couldn't remember the man's name, that we knew an Amish man. His name was Atlee Huckstetler from Ohio. And Jolene and her sisters had met him at a cancer hospital in, in uh, Tijuana. And uh, so we were taking him to his bus, Jolene and I. And I asked him, I said, Atlee, what's the, in your mind, what's the main difference between our practice of Christianity and yours? He says, we practice the ban. And I, I, know, I, I, I've known about Amish because where I grew up in Kansas, we were 35 miles from an Amish community. They still had the horse and buggy and everything. So they practice the band. So what they do is they do that. See, they, they have communal uh, dining rooms. So the whole congregation gets together for meals. Well, they won't even sit down and have a meal with somebody that is sinning in this fashion. They, they ban them with the idea that that'll bring them to shame, bring them to repentance, they'll repent and then they can restore them. But sometimes it doesn't that way, it isn't that way because of human nature, amen? But anyway, that, that was the difference and the Amish do practice that. They practice the ban. And uh, so Paul was calling for that in a sense here at the church of Corinth about this vile sin and they, they were arrogant about it. They, they were almost proud of it that they were so tolerant of this sin. And he says, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. So he uses the term leaven. By the way, when leaven is used in Scripture with few exceptions, it always speaks of sin. And leaven is what makes the loaf of bread expand. And so using that as an example that sin in the congregation, unrepented of and undisciplined, will begin to spread in the congregation and affect others, not just the two people involved. And so he's cutting it off at the pass. And like Jesus warned uh, about just thinking about a woman sexually is committing adultery with her. And of course the flip would be true, the woman with the man as well. You understand what we're saying there? That's a serious sin. So much so that it will affect the rest of the body if not corrected. So that's what they deal with in chapter 5. Now we come to chapter 6. Verse 1. Read aloud with me the first four verses, please. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more are things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? It's talking about the civil judge or the, or the secular judge. One is not a born-again Christian necessarily. He might be a good judge in civil and criminal matters, but this is church business. I say this to your shame, verse 5. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who is able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Verse 7. Now therefore, uh, it is, it is already utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather uh, accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, verse 8, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. That's pretty heavy. In Matthew's gospel, and we'll turn there in a minute, uh, it's clearly outlined what we should do if we have ought against a brother. Uh, in the church. We should settle it at the church level. Don't take it to the courts. Unless there, there is a criminal matter involved then. You know, Paul even appealed to the Roman courts in his day. 
you know. So he, he, wasn't, he wasn't belying what he wrote here then. So with, with criminal matters, things like that, it, it's okay to go to the civil courts. But this is church business, church problems, church squabbles. Very, very often, they're pretty minor stuff. Uh, but we, we make them large, don't we? He says, know yourselves, verse 8, do wrong and cheat, and you do those things to your brethren. So it's the person that's been offended, and now they're going to go to the heathen courts, the, the non-believing judge, to try to settle that issue between two brothers or sisters in the Lord. And uh, ought not to be. He says, isn't there somebody among you who can do this? He says, eventually we're going to judge angels, and we're going to judge others. And that's coming in the millennium, by the way, when you study about that. So, but we're not there yet. So there is a way. So turn back to your left to Matthew's Gospel, chapter uh, 18, and I'll be reading from the 15th verse. The heading in my Bible before the 15th verse is, the offended brother. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. We don't do that a lot of times because we're afraid of their reaction, that they, they won't take it as being loving toward them, but being hostile toward them. But nevertheless, it's to try to settle the issue. And so the, the person that's offended by that other brother, or sister, of course, they need to go to him and t tell him why, why you're having a problem with him. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But, verse 16, if he will not hear, take with you two or more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And that's that's taking some mature Christians in the church and taking them and going and confronting this person when they have denied you going to them personally. And uh, I, I think that you got to really be careful there that you don't just stack the deck against them. <laughs> but you pick mature Christians that are going to be fair. And then you go back. So you have two or three witnesses, two or three witnesses, something is established, right? But if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And so, in other words, turning back over to Satan, like he was talking about in chapter 5. If they're not going to hear the congregation or, or leaders in the church or people that are respected and are stable, then... Treat them like they're a non-believer. Because if they're really a believer, they'll miss the fellowship and they'll repent and, and be restored. That's the idea. Okay. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I, I stopped at verse 8. No, you yourselves do wrong and and cheat, and you do those things to your brother. And so when you don't do it rightly, and you've been offended, then actually you're now doing the same thing back to your brother that you're having a problem with. And then he moves from that to some heavy stuff. Do you not know, verse 9, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So he's saying that unrighteous behavior, and, and I, I'm just paraphrasing here, or surmising here that continued on you you become a backslider and act as if you're not a Christian do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites that covers the whole range of sexual uh, immorality you know, it's not just homosexual behavior, it's sodomy. And, you know, there used to be, may still be, 
uh, laws in the books of our country against sodomy. Yes, there are. Some states yeah, some states still have it. And I'm not trying to be too graphic here, except we, we just have to understand what's going on. And this is not a put down on homosexuals as opposed to heterosexual sin. It's all sin. It's all sex sin. So we go back over this list. He says, neither fornicators, that's people that haven't been married and they're having sex. Uh, in our culture, they're shacking up. Uh, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Adulterers, if you're, you're married, you're cheating on your spouse. Nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So he moves on past the sex sins and he goes to a whole bunch of other sinful practices that we can drop or descend into if we, if we don't do it God's way. And he says the end result of that is you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Ah, but take heart. Verse 11, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Whatever you were in terms of your sexual immorality, you can change. It's not permanent. You weren't born that way. You were born of the sin nature, yes, but you weren't born to sin without repentance sexually or in any of these other ways, being a criminal. Because it says there's a remedy, but such were some of you. And such were some of us sitting right here. Like I'm a former alcoholic and, and some of the rest of you did drugs and alcohol as well. And then along with that were sexual immorality practice as well. And so, but that's old news for us. We've been delivered. We've been set free, amen? We're no longer doing any of that and practicing any of that. And we're not proud of that necessarily except we sing those songs that we're proud of what God has done in our lives, yes. And he always gets the credit for it, and if he doesn't, then we're, we're out of line again. So. All things are lawful for me, verse 12, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That kind of addresses the, the question that some people might bring up. Well, isn't there a little gray area here? In there a little leeway, you know. And what he's saying, yeah, some of those things in and of themselves are not necessarily sinful. But uh, you got to use wisdom. We're not to be brought under the power of anything. See? And I shared this, I think, Friday night. Friday night. That when I was delivered from alcohol, and I was married to my second wife at that point, uh, we were still going to the bars and shooting pool. I was drinking seven up. I wasn't drinking alcohol anymore. And I was so proud of me. And so we're in there and we're in this little bar and a bunch of us are shooting pool. Couples, three couples. And the guy at the bar was really looped and he was cussing and foul. And so I went up to him gently and I said, hey, partner, you know, we, we have ladies here. He says, if you don't like what I'm saying, you don't belong here. Ah, uh, God spoke through that drunk to this old drunk. Stay out of the bars, because if you don't, you'll end up going back, probably, right? And so that was it. I never went back to the bars. So I've been set free from that stuff, but I had to exercise some discipline beyond that. And uh, so that's just kind of an example of here. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful or profitable. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought into the power of any. So whatever we lend ourselves to do that may not be specifically sinful, but if it is drawing us away from the Lord in any, any way on a consistent basis, then we're being brought into the power of it. Yes. And he's saying, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't lend yourself to that stuff. 
foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, verse 13, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will uh, also raise us up by his power. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. And man, that spoke to me later, you know, when I was coming out of that sin life and, and I, I was promiscuous. And, and I thought, man, he's saying, in effect, I belong to Jesus. My, my body's, body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And when I have sexual relations with a non believer or a harlot or a prostitute, just a woman, immoral sex, then it's like joining Jesus to her sexually. And that's desecrating him, degrading his great name. And then we should have tremendous shame of that. Accept God's forgiveness and move on. Amen. Amen. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. It goes back to the Garden of Eden, the way God designed uh, true love between a man and a wife. And the true love, real love, is expressed through that sexual contact in godly sexual contact. That's true love. The rest of it is lust and just using the other person for own gratification. It's really what it is, and Jesus knew that. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. You know, I talked about Joseph when he was in, in Egypt and Potiphar's wife was hitting on him. Remember that? He's only about 17, but he ran from her rather than giving in to her sexual advances. Uh, that took a lot of guts on that kid's part. But he had it. And then, you know the story, uh, God used him, raised him to power in Egypt and so on. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. <sighs> A lot is said there, and it's sobering when we think it through. And in the church today, and if if I'm hitting somebody here, and I don't even know your your lifestyle, so I, I, I'm not deliberately pointing you out. But if there's anybody here that's, uh, that's violating these principles, just go to the Lord with it, repent of it, and uh, He'll give you the power to overcome that, because. Uh, it says our body is not our own. You know, in our culture, people are screaming, I have my rights. I have rights to my own body. I, I ought to make choices to my own body. It's my body. Not to a Christian. Body belongs to the Lord. We, we sang those songs, we're bought at a price. He bought us back out of slavery to sin. We've been studying that in our Friday night studies about uh, the various aspects of salvation, sanctification, justification, etc., et cetera. We bought at a price. Jesus paid the price on the cross. So every time we violate these principles, it's like we're, we're not re-crucifying him, but those are the very things that sent him to the cross. He, he carried those sins to the cross so that we could be relieved of them. God will accept it just as we are. He loves us too much to leave us that way. You understand that? He knows what's going to destroy us spiritually and physically. He loves us too much to leave us there. So we can't tolerate in, in church life known sin without some kind uh, of uh, addressing that. And that's what Paul's talking about here in these six chapters. And uh, then we'll move on next week into the seventh chapter. Right now, I'll go to the table. Come on down and pick up the cup off the table and go back to your seat. And then uh, we'll go through the scriptures as we take communion this morning.